Despite the mountain of proof that the Vatican II claimants to the papacy, that is, John XXIII through Francis, are not true popes but heretical anti-popes who, according to Catholic teaching, have not sat in the chair of St. Peter, many reject the state of Vicantus' position because they think it's impossible for God to have left the Catholic Church for decades without a true pope. They believe it's incompatible with the Catholic Church's dogmatic teaching at Vatican I that St. Peter will have perpetual successors in the primacy. This objection is false and it has been refuted in the past. However, this video will cover some extremely important new points that will hopefully open the eyes of more people to the truth. These facts further demonstrate that those who reject the Sede Vicantis position, the true Catholic position on the current Vatican II crisis, are making a colossal mistake. Please consider the following facts. In various passages of the Old Testament, God promised that King David's throne would be perpetual and that he would have perpetual successors on it. For example, 2 Samuel 7:16, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne, David, will be established forever. 1 Kings 2.45 or 3 Kings 2.45 in the Douai Reims. But King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. Psalm 89 or Psalm 88 in some versions. I have sworn to David my servant, I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. I will not lie to David, his offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun before me. 2 Chronicles 13.5 The Lord God of Israel gave the kingship over Israel forever to David and his sons by a covenant. There are other passages one could cite, but consider Jeremiah 33.17. Quote, For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. End quote. As we can see, God himself promised that the chair or throne of David would be perpetual, that it would have perpetual successors, and that David would never lack a man from his family to sit upon his throne. Well, guess what happened? Shortly after Jeremiah made that prophecy, the Babylonian Empire sacked Jerusalem and took King Zedekiah, a successor to David's throne, into exile where he died. Following King Zedekiah's death around 586 BC, there was no successor to the throne of David for over 500 years. The chair or throne of David, which God himself infallibly promised would be perpetual, would have perpetual successors, and would never lack a man from David's family to sit on the throne, was left vacant by God for more than 500 years. Let me repeat that. The throne was left vacant for over 500 years. Consequently, some people thought that God's promise had failed or they didn't know how it would be fulfilled. So how was the perpetual succession that God promised with regard to the throne of David continued and fulfilled? After a 500 plus year vacancy, the succession of David was continued and fulfilled by Jesus himself. Jesus came and took the throne of David in a manner that many did not expect, and he holds the throne forever. As Luke 1.32 says, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. Concerning Jeremiah 33:17, which stated, For thus says the Lord David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, the Hadoc commentary says, quote, This was verified in Christ who is of the house of David, and whose kingdom in his church shall have no end. The tribe of Judah continued most eminent till his coming, but there was no king till Hircon, and he was of another tribe. The priests governed after Nehemiah, till Herod was appointed by the Romans. This must therefore be explained of Christ's eternal kingdom." Non-Catholic commentators also acknowledge this very long vacancy of the throne of David. This is from a commentary by a famous Methodist, Joseph Benson, who died in 1821. Quote, it is very evident that the prophecies in these verses, that is Jeremiah 33, 17 to 18, were not fulfilled in the Jews after the Babylonish captivity. For from that time to the coming of Christ, David was without a successor of his family sitting upon the throne of Judah or Israel. There can therefore be no doubt that Jeremiah here foretells the kingdom of the Messiah, end quote. So, there was no successor on David's throne from the death of King Zedekiah sometime around or after 586 BC until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ over 500 years later. If there can be a 500 plus year vacancy in the office that God promised would have perpetual successors and never lack a man from David's family, there can easily be a 70 year vacancy in the chair of St. Peter as part of a biblical judgment that fulfills prophecy about the end times. An extended vacancy of the chair of St. Peter is exactly what we've seen in the Vatican II apostasy, as an abundance of theological evidence proves. Before we cover more on the throne of David and its relevance to the current situation, let's revisit Vatican I. Vatican I made a number of dogmatic statements about the perpetuity of the papal office. A canon frequently cited in this regard is the following, quote, If anyone then says that it is not from the institution of Christ the Lord himself, or by divine right, that the blessed Peter has perpetual successors in the primacy over the universal church, or that the Roman pontiff is not the successor of blessed Peter in the same primacy, let him be anathema, end quote. This canon obviously does not mean that the chair of St. Peter cannot be vacant. The chair of St. Peter was vacant numerous times in church history after a pope died and before the next pope was elected. This period without a pope was called an interregnum, 
and it could last for years. Rather, Vatican I's canon means that every time there is a valid pope, he is perpetually a successor of St. Peter in the same primacy. That is, he possesses the same authority that St. Peter had over the church. This right of primacy will last until the end of time. Johann Franzlin was a theologian at Vatican I, who was named a cardinal by Pope Pius IX. In 1887, after Vatican I's dogmatic definitions, he wrote the following on the matter of the perpetuity of the papal office, quote, Hence a distinction arises between the seat and the one sitting in it in the matter of perpetuity. The seat, that is, the perpetual right of the primacy, owing to God in his unchangeable law and supernatural providence, and owing to the church in her right and duty of forever keeping as a deposit the power divinely instituted for the individual successors of Peter, and of procuring their succession by a firm law, never ceases. But the individual heirs or those sitting in the apostolic seat are mortal men, and so the seat can never fail, but it can be vacant, and often is vacant. Even at that time there indeed remain the divine law and institution of perpetuity." End quote. Thus, the institution remains perpetual even when the see is vacant. Various theologians taught that the chair of St. Peter could be vacant for a long time. For example, Father Edmund D'O'Reilly, another prominent theologian who died after Vatican I, said that there could have been a papal interregnum, that is, a period without a pope, that lasted for the entirety of the Great Western Schism, which was almost 40 years. Here's what he approved after the Council. Quote, the Great Schism of the West, 1378 to 1417, suggests to me a reflection which I take the liberty of expressing here, that the true church should remain between 30 and 40 years without a thoroughly ascertained head and representative of Christ on earth, this would not be. Yet it has been, and we have no guarantee that it will not be again. What I would infer is that we must not be too ready to pronounce on what God may permit. We, or our successors, and future generations of Christians, shall perhaps see stranger evils than have yet been experienced, even before the immediate approach of that great winding up of all things on earth that will precede the day of judgment. Contingencies regarding the church, not excluded by the divine promises, cannot be regarded as practically impossible, just because they would be terrible and distressing in a very high degree." End quote. He also said, Not that an interregnum covering the whole period of the Great Western Schism would have been impossible or inconsistent with the promises of Christ, for this is by no means manifest. End quote. Those are important points, but what we have demonstrated with regard to the 500 plus year vacancy of the throne of David, a throne that God promised would have perpetual successors, proves that a long vacancy of the chair of St. Peter is not at all contrary to Vatican I, indefectibility, or God's promises to his church. Indeed, this extended vacancy of the chair of St. Peter was foreshadowed and indicated in prophecy. What's additionally fascinating about this comparison between the vacancy of the throne of David and the current vacancy of the throne of St. Peter is that in both cases Babylon was involved. It was Old Testament Babylon, the Babylonian Empire, that sacked Jerusalem, causing this 500 plus year vacancy of the throne of David. God allowed the extended vacancy as a punishment for the sins of people. And it is New Testament Babylon, the whore of Babylon, the prophesied end times counterchurch, the Vatican II sect in Rome under the apostate antipopes, which has unlawfully taken control of the church's physical structures. This has resulted in a decades-long vacancy of the chair of St. Peter, while manifest heretics who were not validly elected have pretended to be popes in Rome. Our videos Apocalypse Now in the Vatican, Babylon Has Fallen Fallen, and Revelation 18.2 Just Happened show that the Vatican II sect and its apostate antipopes fulfill prophecy about the whore of Babylon in many striking ways. The first pope, St. Peter, was martyred in Rome and buried at the site of St. Peter's Basilica in modern-day Vatican City. St. Peter's own words in 1 Peter 5.13 indicate that New Testament Babylon is located where he is located. That means that the location of New Testament Babylon is Rome, and more specifically it is St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican where St. Peter was buried. That's why the prophecies about the Whore of Babylon have been fulfilled at that very spot. As just one example, Revelation 18.2 says that Babylon has fallen and become the habitation of demons and the prison of every unclean bird and beast. On December 8, 2015, the 50th anniversary of the close of Vatican II, during the Fiat Lux light show, the Vatican projected images of unclean birds and beasts onto the facade of St. Peter's Basilica, right above where St. Peter is buried, in stunning correspondence to the words of Revelation 18.2. It thus happened at the very location of New Testament Babylon. Now consider this. Old Testament Babylon sacked Jerusalem in 586 BC under King Nebuchadnezzar II. In the capital of his Babylonian empire, he is believed to have built the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. They were considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This is a famous depiction of what the Hanging Gardens of Babylon looked like. You can see the vines and the trees hanging over the pillars. These Hanging Gardens of Babylon were perhaps the most prominent feature in the capital of the Babylonian empire, which took God's people into captivity and caused a vacancy in the throne of David. 
Now look at these images from the Fiat Lux light show at St. Peter's Basilica. In addition to the images of the birds and beasts which match the description of the Whore of Babylon in Revelation 18.2, you can see a replication of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Notice the vines hanging over the pillars, just like in the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Do you think that's just a coincidence? Well, it's not. It's another sign to confirm the link between Old Testament Babylon, the Babylonian Empire which took God's people into captivity as part of a biblical judgment, and New Testament Babylon, the apostate Vatican II sect which rises near the end of the world in the place where St. Peter is located as part of a biblical judgment during the Great Apostasy. New Testament Babylon has led multitudes of former members of the true church, the Catholic Church, into apostasy and away from the true Catholic faith, and thus into spiritual captivity. So, those who think that they are defending the Catholic Church by defending the Vatican II antipopes are totally deceived. You are not defending the Catholic Church. You are aligning yourself with apostate antipopes and the prophesied end times whore of Babylon. The Vatican II sect is the end times Babylonian captivity. However, since this is a biblical judgment on the New Testament people of God, it occurs in New Testament Babylon, the place where St. Peter is located, the Vatican, not in Old Testament Babylon. It also occurs in connection to a spiritual deception. The Vatican II Babylonian captivity has caused an extended vacancy of the chair of St. Peter, just like the Old Testament Babylonian captivity was connected to a vacancy of the throne of David. Furthermore, there is an undeniable link between the office of David in the Old Testament and the office of St. Peter in the New Testament. People who engage in papal apologetics are aware of this link. Jesus' kingdom, his church, is patterned after David's kingdom and Old Testament Israel. The royal ministers who formed the royal cabinet in the Davidic monarchy, as well as the twelve tribes of Israel, prefigured the twelve apostles of Jesus. David's prime minister received a key, and Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to St. Peter. Our video, The Bible Proves the Papacy, also demonstrates that there is a striking correspondence between what King David did at a council in Jerusalem recorded in 1 Chronicles 28, and what St. Peter did at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. At the First Chronicles 28 council, David stood up and said, The Lord God chose me out of the whole house of my father to be king. At the Acts 15 council, Peter stood up and said, God chose from among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. At the Council of Jerusalem, Peter said and did what David said and did, using the exact same word chose, precisely because Peter had supreme authority over the New Covenant Church, just as King David had supreme authority over Israel. The Church is the Israel of God, Galatians 6.16. It therefore makes perfect sense that as the Babylonian captivity in the Old Testament was connected to a long vacancy of the throne of David, the Babylonian captivity in the end times is connected to a long vacancy of the throne or chair of St. Peter. It's also noteworthy that the extended vacancy of David's throne, caused by the Babylonian Empire, preceded Christ's first coming. It makes sense, therefore, that an extended vacancy of the throne of St. Peter would precede Christ's second coming. So, how will the perpetual succession in St. Peter's chair continue after this long vacancy that has been caused by the Vatican II antipopes? In the first millennium, popes were often elected by the acclamation of the clergy and people of Rome. St. Robert Bellarmine points out that if all the cardinals died at once, the right of electing the pope would go either to a council or to the clergy of Rome. God could arrange events so that a true Catholic would be acclaimed the pope in Rome and consecrated a bishop, similar to the manner of election in the first millennium. However, considering that we are clearly in the end times and witnessing the fulfillment of prophecies about the whore of Babylon, the beast, and the Antichrist, I don't believe that's the most likely scenario. What I believe to be most likely is that just as Jesus Christ himself came the first time and ended the vacancy of David's throne by sitting on the throne and holding it forever, Jesus will return, assume the throne of St. Peter, and hold it forever, perpetually. Jesus is the invisible head of the church. A valid pope is merely his representative, his vicar, and is said to be the visible head of the church. When Jesus comes back in glory, he will assume visible primacy and headship over his flock. Thus, the succession of the chair of St. Peter can continue forever in exactly the same way that the perpetual succession to the throne of David continued forever after the long vacancy by Jesus himself. That makes the most sense in my view. The vacancy of the throne of David lasted for over 500 years. Of course, we don't believe that the current vacancy of the chair of St. Peter will last that long. Although Israel lacked a king on the throne for hundreds of years, the people were taken into captivity in Babylon, as Jeremiah prophesied, for 70 years. See Jeremiah 25, 11-12 and Jeremiah 29:10. Since the Vatican II sect and its apostate antipopes definitely represent the whore of Babylon and the end times Babylonian captivity, it would make sense that the current situation in which there is not a valid pope but a series of antipopes in Rome might last 70 years. 
Indeed, why would God choose to use the specific word Babylon in 1 Peter 5 and the Apocalypse out of all the words he could have used, thus drawing a direct link to Old Testament Babylon, unless he intended to indicate that this end times Babylonian captivity in the place where St. Peter is located would also last for decades, just as the Old Testament Babylonian captivity lasted for decades, 70 years in fact. The first Vatican II antipope, the manifest heretic John XXIII, took control in Rome after his false election on October 28, 1958. That most plausibly represents the start of the captivity. Some might argue that the captivity really began with the official promulgation of Vatican II on December 8, 1965. The Fiat Lux light show, which matched the description of Revelation 18.2, occurred on the 50th anniversary of the close of Vatican II. That was not just a coincidence, since the Vatican II sect is the Whore of Babylon. But since the anti-popes were already reigning in Rome, the view that the captivity didn't start until 1965 is less likely. This Vatican II Babylonian captivity might end sooner than 70 years. Perhaps it will last longer. But 70 years would be another precise parallel to what happened in the Old Testament, and the language that scripture uses in Jeremiah and the Apocalypse or Book of Revelation to describe the Old and New Testament events with regard to Babylon is strikingly similar in various passages. And of course, no man knows the day or the hour when Jesus Christ will return. However long this vacancy in the Babylonian captivity lasts, we are in the end times and witnessing the fulfillment of prophecy about the end times beast, the whore of Babylon, the Antichrist, etc. See our video Apocalypse Now in the Vatican. The facts in this video prove that there is nothing contrary to Catholic teaching or Vatican I in recognizing that there hasn't been a valid pope since Pope Pius XII and that all the Vatican II claimants to the papacy are heretical antipopes. That is the true position. It is the conclusion that Catholic teaching requires one to reach in light of the facts. The Vatican II antipopes are notorious heretics and apostates. They are not true popes. They lead the Whore of Babylon, the prophesied end times counterchurch. We want to close this video with a short section from our video Apocalypse Now in the Vatican, which concerns the Whore of Babylon. Vatican II, which closed on December 8, 1965, was the very Council of Apostasy that ushered in and characterizes the apocalyptic counterchurch, the end times Whore of Babylon. The Vatican II sect clearly fulfills prophecy about the Whore of Babylon in many other ways as well. Apocalypse 18.3 says that all nations have drunk the wine of her rage for fornication. The Apocalypse mentions the wine of the whore's fornication more than once because after Vatican II, changes were made to the wine portion of the form of consecration in the new mass. The change of many to all in the form of consecration falsified the words of Christ and caused those quote masses to be invalid. The whore is said to be clothed round about in purple and scarlet because bishops wear purple and cardinals wear scarlet. And men in purple and scarlet are a common sight in Vatican City. The whore has various externals but not the substance of the true Catholic Church. The whore is drunk with the blood of saints and martyrs because it mocks the saints by its false ecumenism and religious indifferentism. In Apocalypse 17.6 we read that when St. John saw the whore he wondered great wonder. The noun translated wonder in that verse is thauma. It's only used one other time in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 11.14, where it is used to describe the shock, astonishment, or confusion engendered by false apostles posing as apostles of Christ. It makes sense that when St. John saw the whore he wondered great wonder, because it's a counterchurch led by false apostles of Peter, that is, antipopes who claim to be successors of the apostle Peter, but are not. Indeed, when the Apocalypse says that people shall wonder to see the beast because it has come back, it uses the verb thaumadzo, the verbal form of thauma. That's a further indication that when pagan Rome returns, it will be under the appearance of apostles and ministers of Christ. That is, it will be pagan Rome under the appearance of the church, a counter-church. Hence, when pagan Rome returns in the last days under the appearance of apostles and ministers of Christ, it is not engaging in a physical persecution, but an attempted spiritual subversion. According to Apocalypse 17.4, the whore has a golden cup in her hand. This refers to the false priesthood and false masses in the Vatican II counterchurch. Apocalypse 18.6 refers to the cup wherein the whore has mixed or mingled. That's a reference to the mixing of water and wine at the new mass. That reference signifies that the whore has committed severe violations in that area of liturgy by falsifying the true worship of the Catholic Church. Interestingly, the ancient depiction of the woman Europa is on a vase used for mixing water and wine. That's another indication that this reference in Apocalypse 18.6 is to Europe having become a spiritual whore by means of its apostasy from Catholicism and its liturgical abominations. Further, the statement in that verse, double to her double according to her works, corresponds to 1 Timothy 5.17. There we read that priests who rule well are esteemed worthy of double honor. 
But Apocalypse 18.6 says of the whore, double to her double according to her works, because she represents false priests and false ministers who act and rule in an evil fashion. One could give more examples of the connection between the Vatican II sect and the Whore of Babylon. Since the Vatican II sect is clearly the Whore of Babylon and the Whore sits on top of the end times beast, it makes sense that the Antichrist, the one who is wounded and then has his image honored, was connected to the events in Vatican City during this period. This further supports the conclusion that John Paul II was the Antichrist. Moreover, when the beast under Nero put St. Peter to death, Peter was killed on Vatican Hill, which is located in present-day Vatican City. So when the beast rose in the first century, it persecuted the visible leader of the church in that very place, what is now Vatican City. Peter was buried there, in what is now Vatican City, with his grave located under the high altar in St. Peter's Basilica. When Christianity spiritually conquered Rome and Europe, the most prominent physical structure in Christianity was built at that very spot where St. Peter is buried, in what is now Vatican City. It therefore makes sense that when the beast comes back and the whore is sitting on top of it, the prophecies will play out right there in Vatican City, where St. Peter is buried. And that is what has happened. That's why we see that prophecies about the beast, the seven kings, the Antichrist, and the whore of Babylon have been fulfilled right there in Vatican City. The fulfillment of these prophecies in Rome serves to prove, not disprove, that the Catholic Church is the one true church of Jesus Christ. The great deception centers around deceiving those who claim to be Catholic and those who claim to profess union with Rome. You will find much biblical proof for the Catholic faith on our website vaticancatholic.com and in our material. The prophecies about Rome's fall and whoredom concern the city of Rome's fall from the Catholic faith because the Catholic faith is the one true faith of Jesus Christ outside of which there is no salvation. But to be a true Catholic, one must be a traditional Catholic.